Okay. Good morning, family. Everybody hear me okay? All right. Sorry about little technical difficulties. We're working out some things in myself and the computer. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you. I think I saw past Ed there. Okay, we're good then. How you guys doing? I'm cutting my music down in the back. I've been working with some Ron Canoli this morning. Been having a wonderful time there. All right. So good morning, good morning, good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody have a blessed week. Good to see you this morning in our Zoom service. And I pray to God that we have a wonderful time in the Lord. So let's go on and get started. Hold on a minute. Um, got some things here going on with my computer screen. Hold on one second. There we go. And my wife has played me some music this morning. So I go and suspend that. So let's go and get started in prayer this morning, okay? All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful day. Father, we thank you for a wonderful week. We thank you, Father God, that your spirit continue to be with us, leading us and guiding us. Father God, we thank you for your protective power. Lord, that you've been keeping us well, Lord, in our spirits and our bodies and our minds. And physically, Father God, we just thank you, Father God, for being our Savior, our Lord, our King, being all things unto us, Father God. We thank you that even though some may consider this a difficult time, Father God, that you are always with us, Father God, and you are always strengthening us, Father God, for whatever we have to go through. Father God, we thank you that even as Peter, Father God, that as we're strengthened in faith, Father God, that we get to encourage others, Father God, to be overcomers in Christ's name. Father God, we thank you for the ministry of reconciliation, Father God, that and through, throughout our lives, Father God, through the ministry of Jesus Christ, Father God, that we have an example, Father God, that we are to be witnesses, Father God, to demonstrate the love of God, Father God. And Lord, I thank you, Father God, for you bringing us together, each and every one, blessing our families. And Father God, as we go before you with the word this morning, Father God, we pray, Father God, that I would just diminish to nothing, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would minister your word with power and authority and with revelation, Father God, that what you called us to do, Father God, that we may hear, be believers of your word, and we may be doers of your word. And Father God, we just thank you for everything, Father God. Open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits to hear what you have for us this day, Father God. We thank you, we honor you, we love you, in your precious holy name, amen. Amen. So, hope everyone had a blessed week. I was uh, in my meditation time this week. I was just um, really meditating. I was talking to one of our brothers that you know, Larry Anderson, and you know, the word of God just came out and it just said simply, you know, turn off your TV and turn down your plates. So you probably saw that I put that on the uh, the Facebook. I don't normally, I'm still like Pastor Ed, I don't do Facebook too much, but every now and then Lord give me a word and I wasn't going to put it up there. And I spoke to Larry and I told him the word that God gave me, turn off the TV, turn down your plates. And I don't watch TV that much, but it's just a, a wonderful reminder by the Holy Spirit because as we see a lot of uh, information go out, a lot of information going out this time. I mean, it's coming from so many directions. I don't know how you or I try to keep up with it. That's why I don't try to keep up with it. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to hear from heaven when you're hearing from so many different sources. 
And I invite you this week to turn those sources not down, turn them off. And as you turn your plate over, I would like to invite you to, to invite the source of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God, to instruct you on everything to do. You know, we hear so much today, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Why do this? Why do that? And it's a lot of stuff. And I mean, lies, propaganda, and so many things, but has nothing to do with kingdom. Nothing to do with kingdom. And it's amazing. I was reading this week about the kingdom of God. And, you know, number one is forever. You know, we don't have to fight in this kingdom. We don't have to worry about, you know, being on the top or the bottom. We don't have to run behind a man or anything. But all we have to do is stay focused on the kingdom of God. And God will instruct us. But it's hard to do when so many things is coming at us mentally, spiritually, and physically. But don't forget what you watch. It goes in your spirit. And I know some people, they wake up, they just get in whatever they're getting into and and it's a mess. They turn on the news and they turn on this. They got their own source online. They got the Facebook and all this kind of stuff. It's so many platforms out there. It's, it's really ridiculous. But really, we need to just shut the noise out. So this week, and, and, and I know you'll continue to do it, because I tell you, before I even turn my plate over good, I, I mean, fasting, I, I'm like, Lord, my, my, and the Holy Spirit just instructed me on what not just to do, but what not to do what not to get involved in. So I just ask you to do that this week and, and really just concentrate on, you know, the kingdom of God and get rid of the noise. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. All right. So we've already prayed and I see others already logging in. Thank God for that. Uh, if you want to put on your video so I can see you, that'd be nice too. It's good to see your faces since we have this platform. But we're going to get right into the word. So we're going to finish up today. I'm not going to be before you long, I think. But uh, we're going to finish up how to be great in the kingdom. How to be great in the kingdom of God. So we looked at that last week. We started about started oh, about the definition of looking at greatness. You know, when we see a person or a thing or event and talking about people, you know, how do we determine that these people or even us that we're gonna talk about are great. Now, we talked about that from man's point of view, you know, greatness can be part of your achievements. You know, we call it the measure of success. You know, if you get, you know, getting certain degrees and, and having certain profession and rank, we talked about that. We talked about that even slipped into the church and, you know, we think you're great now if you have some degree, if you have some title, you know, apostle, bishop. You know, and it's easy to see in the world that we get confused because the church sometimes take a world view of things. Now, you already know that's error. We take a kingdom view always. Matter of fact, God has given us his vision so we can see the way he sees. So he doesn't want us to be confused. And we looked at some of the definitions and some of those definitions, excuse me, even talked about a person's skill. Skill set, you know, if they have flair, you know, and we see this, you know, we see this sometimes in the kingdom of God, you know, we look at people based on their skill set. We talked about even people take tests when you go into certain ministry, you know, you join certain ministry today that you got to take a test. You know, they want to see what skills you have. You know, they want to see if you got finesse, they, they want to see if you got flair, you know, and this is not we know that's, that's, that's the kingdom. That's not a kingdom mindset. That's a worldly mindset. But we see this. We see this all the time. You know, and we see that people make error. Error, E-R-R-O-R. -R -R. And we looked at it from a point of view that um, it can also be, you know, based on people's perspective. What you consider somebody doing great. You know, maybe basketball, football, you may consider a person great, then you turn around and another person, no, I don't consider that person great. I know someone greater because they did this or they did that feat. So we started out, you know, thinking and, and setting our minds on what God would consider to be great. And we're going to talk about this at the end because God desires us to be great. He wants us to be great for his glory. He wants his greatness to be seen in and through us the church. So God desires to be great. 
but not in the eyes of the world, but is in the eyes of his kingdom. Now, we first looked at, we're going to just do a quick review. We looked at, you know, Matthew 23, how Christ, he contested the greatness uh, when asked by his disciples. You know, and he talked, and Jesus uh, told them, you know, you look at the scribes and the Pharisees, they go around, <coughs> excuse me, they go into temple, and they desire to be called great. You know, they, they call, they want to be called rabbi, rabbi, teacher. You know, they have a certain apparel about themselves. They have these big phylacteries, you know, broad phylacteries. And we talked about that last week because that phylactery is a box, a wooden box that they contain, that contain the law. I mean, the law of God or the law of Moses. And they put it broad on their chest to make sure people understand that or think anyway that they're keeping the law. But Jesus said that they would, it's all a, a facade. You know, they would go around and they would call, make you call them great. And they want you to think that they're great based on their apparel and the way they act. You know, they wanted the best seats in the house. It said the best seat at the table. And they were supposed to be great in doing this. But Jesus told them that, no, they lower this thing over you and they ask you to do things and keep certain sacrifice and religious duties that they don't even keep. You know, all of a sudden, an illusion of greatness. And unfortunately, today we have a lot of illusion of greatness, not character now. And we're going to talk about that, jump ahead a little bit, because, you know, character is one of those things that determine greatness in God's eyes. It's not your, you, you know, how well you seem your apparel, but your character. What's not on the outside, but what's on the inside? What's on the inside? As Pastor Ed will say, you know, who you are. Not who you pretend to be, but who you really are. Not what you are, what you're trying to be, but who you are from your inner man, your innermost parts. That's what flows out. So as the Pharisees here, they had this outward appearance of being great. But in the inside, they were full of sin. Hypocrisy, religion, not relationship. And then we actually looked at uh, Luke 22. We're going to go back to that, but just paraphrase real quick, just looking at that real quick. You know, that, you know, this was kind of fun. And we're going to go back to that because here you are, they had, they were, um, you know, having a communion. You know, people call it the Last Supper. And, you know, here Jesus, he's talking about, you know, certain things. And, and, and these his disciples, his followers break out and a dispute rose among them. Who is the greatest? And then he said, the greatest among them would be like the youngest or the youth or the least of them or be a servant. And then he gives this scenario, you know, who is the greatest is the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves. And then Jesus, I mean, I'm sure was surprised at them. He said, I'm the one, I come, Jesus, I come as if I'm the one who's serving, not reclining at the table. So his perspective of greatness is definitely different than ours. <laughs> but remember, we are to take on a kingdom perspective. Now, we talked about greatness doesn't always look great. So in our own eyes, we don't determine our greatness. Only God does. We talked about Peter. You know, Peter, you know, when he was revealed who the son of God was and who, who Jesus was, he said that, you know, only the father revealed this to you. And then he talked about how on that faith, that faith that he has, and we're going to talk about that, that, that faith that what he's going to establish his church on, that faith and that belief, that foundation of who Jesus Christ is. And we know Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the rock. So we don't know who Jesus is. How can he be our foundation? Oh, how can we be saved? How can we be a Christian? Okay, so, but then, remember, you know, and he also said, you know, back in the, in the scriptures, I'm going to go back to that, and that was in uh, 20, Luke 22, that he also talked about him, uh, Luke is going to betray him, not only once or twice, but three times, and Jesus encouraging him, you're not going to look, you know, it's okay, 
So sometimes we do falter. Sometimes we do fail in our own eyes, in the natural eye. But as long as we keep our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he will continue to move us towards greatness. So here he sees, even though he denied Christ three times, and I know where you and I, I mean, I would, we, we see people do that. They do one thing or they do something, and all of a sudden they, they, they lose fellowship. Not just with those in the house of God and in, in, in the sanctuary, but also they, they lose fellowship with God. They think they're not good enough. You know, they, they, they think God can't restore them. And I love the word of God. It says, because when someone falter or fails, he said, as our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to restore them, bring them back into that fellowship with us and with one another. Because God's plan for them doesn't cease just because you and I mess up. See, that's true greatness. Greatness is not determined on you nor me. It's determined on God and what he desires for us. Okay? So... Let's actually, yeah, I'm going to uh, skip that part for time. So in Luke 9, I want to go back to that, actually. Um, Luke 9 and, and, and 46, other example that we did last week. We'll probably go there in a few minutes. But he also, Jesus perceiving the thoughts in their hearts. Now, here there are another dispute rose out among them. And Jesus, here he is deceiving you know what's in their heart. You know what the Holy Spirit does. It divides, even asunder. And, and, and what's in us, it divides our intent. So here Jesus, he, he perceives the thoughts and intents of their heart. And then he took a little child. And then he said, he set the child with him and said, you know, whosoever receive this little child in my name, he said, receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you will be the great. So now he's talking about, you know, he brings this child into play. And, you know, he talk, now they do what, uh, do what we do sometimes. You know, we, we want to bring these great men. You know, we consider these great men among us. And here Jesus, he, he flips the script on him. He brings this child. You know, you know all the way the history of that every time he, you know, he had to tell them to suffer the child coming to me when they, when they want to come for prayer. You know, we always pushing them away. But here he's talking about the childlike in heart and humility. Humility of a child. And that's why he said that you can't even enter into the kingdom of God unless you come as a child. You have to come humble. And you have to see things from God's perspective. So like a child trusting a parent. The way we trust God is our Savior, Lord. You know, he's not just our Savior, he's Lord. We have to trust him with our very lives. We have to trust him in everything that we do every day, not the things of the world. Now, I know some people, they put their trust in the world, you know, to be great. You know, we talked about those accumulations. But that's not what he's talking about here. And I want to go actually to Matthew 19. I want to start here. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Now, we read this about how Christ, you know, he counsels here the rich young ruler. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. I want to read this. Didn't cut on my light over there, but I think I can read. I got my glasses on. So, you ready? Matthew chapter 19, let's start at verse 16. I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible. Now, here we are with the rich young ruler. I'm going to read from And behold, there came a man up to him, saying, Teacher, what excellent and perfectly and essential good deed must I do to possess eternal life? Now, here we go. You know, trying to ask Jesus here, what can I do to be great? Now, you notice how he asked this. He said, what excellent. Now, you and I, think about, we're asking this. How excellent, what excellent and perfectly and essential good deed must I do to possess, possess eternal life? You know, first of all, you know, it's not in our power. You know, it's only by faith that we are saved. 
You know, we can't do anything. We talked about that last week. It, you can't do any deeds. You know, you can't go out getting, you know, I, I got to get so many people saved. I got to do this. I got I to achieve the, a, a bishop, teacher in the church. You know, I got to go out and I got to feed the hungry. I got, you notice even Jesus, when he walked on the earth, he only did what his master commanded and told him to do. He said, I only say and do what my father in heaven tells me to say and do. You know, and sometimes as Christians, we mean well. And I'm not talking about benevolence, but yet I am. You know, sometimes we just love to run out and do what we want to do. But that's what I was telling you earlier about turning the TV off and, you know, even things that in your, your, your platform and, and on, online and, and turn down your plate. Because so you can hear from heaven. And then in verse 17, and he said to him, why do you ask me about the perfectly and essentially good? Now, already he should know this. If he's following Christ, you know, which he claimed he did when he came up there. You know, there was many disciples in the days. And there was many people who heard about Christ and was following Christ. So here Jesus asked him, why do you ask me about these perfectly and essential good things? There, and he says, there is only one who is good, who is perfectly and essentially good, and he says, God. And you, and if you would enter into the life, you must continue into the life or relationship with God, you must continually keep his commandments. And you already know that. He shattered off the commandments here, and, you know, God, you know, thou should not kill. You know, he, 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 he you know, talks about the commandments, and we know them. And then at the end, Jesus tells him, well, if you really want to be good and great, you know, it's not anything that you can do in your own power. You've accumulated things so others can think that you're great. And so you can think you thought that you were great. But here, I want you to go forsake the things that you call great. And I want you to enter in a relationship with God through me. So I just told you who is great and perfectly good, only God. And the only way now you can achieve that is come and follow Christ as we do and enter into a relationship with the one who is great and essentially good. And that's God. And you already know, sad to say, and we do this today. It says this guy, he went away sad. He couldn't do that. I was thinking about that. How many of us do the same thing? You know, we're running around, we're, we're doing all these things for the kingdom. And we want people to look at us and see what kind of ministry we have, how big our car, big the house, planes and all this other stuff, how big the building is that we built. And here Christ comes to us in our spirit. See, that's why you got to turn your plate over. And he just wants us to follow the great one, which is Christ. Only thing he wants us to do is follow him. Only thing that we're required to do is do what Christ called us to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm talking about the weight just got lifted. Because, see, there's no performance. I don't have to worry about I don't have to worry about hearing a message about what to do in, in the kingdom to be great. You know, there's a lot of books out there saying, you know, it talks about this, the Holy Spirit, and explaining who the Holy Spirit is. You know, why don't we just enter into a relationship with the Holy Spirit? You know, I like to keep things common. You know, marriage. I'm married. I've been married for 28 wonderful years. You know, I didn't go to someone and they've been talking to me 28 years about my wife, how to treat her, what to do. Now, we have marriage ministry, but I enter into a relationship with her. And she tells me what she likes, what she considers good relationship. So how dare us, through that example, treat Christ or God differently? You know, instead of we trying to perform in our ministries, perform out in public, you know, why don't we just listen and enjoy God through his son, Jesus Christ, and allow him to be great through us? Because you and I, brother and sister, we can't achieve greatness on our own. So he says here that only through God that you can achieve greatness, which is eternal life. Only he, God, has the power and authority to be good and perfect and great. Yet he made this possible for you and I through a relationship with Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. 
as we humble ourselves and come to him as a child. So again, it's measured by character, not accumulation, as the rich young ruler did. You know, and we do that. I, I was listening to something this week, and that's why I had to turn my thing off, because I'm listening to people and, you know, ministers are, it, it's, it's shameful, as God will say. You know, they get up there and they tell you, and people, people in the community, they, we, they do the same thing. Can't tell us in between the world and, and, the, and the kingdom of God. You know, telling you how great God blessed them because they got this, I got that, I got this. You know, okay, God gave us the ability to get wealth, but then he tell us that we're, we're distributors, we're, we're managers. And, and what you have, you know, we talk about the middle and the, and the might. What she had was greater and what she gave was greater than all those who gave. You know, so it's achieved through relationship with the great one. I'll be religious and I wrote this and checking the boxes and appearance of any earthly gain does not achieve this. It's because you attend the Sunday school, attend the church, checking the box, being religious. It doesn't achieve this, but only through a relationship with the great mighty one himself. So we talked about greatness. What's your viewpoint? Is it from a worldly viewpoint or is it a godly viewpoint? <laughs> See, but God desires us here to be great. Such as he, God desired him to be great, but we can only be great in the kingdom. We can only be great through Christ as he bridges that relationship with the great and mighty God. And then God would do the same things that he did through Christ. He would show his greatness through us as he did through Christ. He will walk and instruct us the way he did Christ so that we can be like Christ, that we only do and say what he called us to do and say. See, then we don't have to worry about man's greatness. You know, and then we'll get that well done, that good and faithful. But here's the key, serve it. Not greatness in your own eyes. So let's go to Luke 22. I want to go to that real quick. So God desires us to be great. Luke chapter 22. Right at the mark. Now, I like this because even though we said that greatness always doesn't look great. In the beginning. And here we're going to see that Satan not only desired to sift Luke, but he desired to sift all the disciples, just like he desires to sift us. Now, you know what sifting is, you know, get us off the course, you know, uh, uh, discourage us. So here, but Jesus tells them of his predestination. We read this before. So we'll read this real quick. Let's start at 19. Uh, Luke twenty two nineteen. <clears throat> Let's see how far we're going to go here. Probably to 30. We'll make it real quick. Luke chapter 19. Um, actually, that was he took bread. Let's go down. I see the cup. Began to inquire among themselves. Okay. Actually, hold on one second. We kind of read that. I didn't want to, I, not wasting time, but I didn't want to go through and read that. But it talks about the same thing as he, you know, here, um, they talked about who was going to be the greatest here. 22. And he tells them at the end here that they will be actually sitting with God and judging people in the kingdom of God. So he appears here, he tells them, that their predestination. So you can read through that. I want to read through something else that makes it a little bit clear. But here, you know, even though Satan seeks to shift, sift us and get us off course, God says, even as though he said it to disciples, he said the same thing to us, that we are predestined. And that's why I want to go to, we're predestined for greatness. But only if we remain in Christ. Because that links us to the great one. As Christ said here, he said only one is good, and that's God. 
So if you and I want to be great, we have to be have a relationship with Christ. But here, and when we're in Christ, and we know that when we're in Christ, that nothing can touch us. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have any trials and tribulation like Luke and the disciples did. You know, things may come upon us, um, upon us and, I, you know, we don't like to say even unto death. But nothing can take us out of the predestined state that God has us in. It says nothing can take us out of his hand. Perils of famines or, or, or even death. And nothing can stop the predestined because it's predestination. We're predestined to be with God. Not just here on earth, but also forever. So here he predestined, he tells the disciples of their predestination. That even though Satan seeks to sift them and get them off course, he said, nah, let me tell you your end. Now, I don't know about that to you, but we're going to see that's encouraging to me. Because sometimes in this world, we see things go on, and then Christ says, and that's why I love, you know, I said, turning your plate over. Because sometimes we need to remind ourselves the end results. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So we look at things going on around us, and I see some people get discouraged, and even though it's cold, but nothing. We are predestined to be in Christ forever and to do his good works and great deeds that he considers great. So he talks about their predestination. Let, now let's talk about ours. Let's go to Ephesians 1. I didn't read that because I want to read Ephesians 1. I want to do that because Ephesians is one of my favorite chapters. And this is one of my favorite chapters too here. I love Ephesians. <clears throat> and I want to have a little time to read this. So it talks about Ephesians 1, and there's a lot of scripture that talks about this. We're going to do about two or three. It talks about our predestination. Now, our predestination, saints, is greatness through Christ and what God's considered great. Now, this encourages me. It just put a smile on my face this week. So Ephesians 1, he starts out by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, you and I now, with those are at Ephesus, and to the faithful one in Christ Jesus. See, we're the faithful one. Please Remain the faithful ones in Jesus Christ. Those who are seeking his face and are following him, not the things of this world, faithful unto God. Remember, faith means to trust him and rely on him. So to the faithful one, us in Jesus Christ, grace be to you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Wow. According as he has chosen us in him, here it is. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, that's our predestination. Now, we talked about that a while back, you know, how Christ was predestined. It says that the word of God said Christ was predestined. And I think we talked about that when I said walking out, you know, working out your soul's salvation, your workout. How's your workout? You know, Christ was predestined. He was slain before the foundation of the world. He was already predestined to do this great thing for God. And now it's also about you and I. We were predestined from before the foundation of the world that you and I would be holy in the right whole relationship with God without blame before him in love, having predestined us, you and I, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pledge of his will. So we've been saved here. He adopted him into us, not for us. See, we just benefactors. You know, it sort of goes back to, in Luke, when he was talking about the Sadducees and Pharisees, he said, they lower things over you and you're called benefactors. But the thing you're benefacting over is death and sin and religion, hypocrisy. But here now, we're benefactors of the kingdom of heaven. See, you can, you can invest in man's kingdom, and you still a benefactor. They're going to lower things over you. If you follow man, just like the, the word said in Luke and also in Matthew, you're going to be a benefactor. So you're going to get something out of it if you follow man, but you're going to get what they got. And you know, God said, you know, he turned around and tell them, hey, you, you, you serve the devil. You, you, I'm not. God is not your father. The devil is your father based on your deeds. 
You think you're great. You do look great. People in the community may call you rabbi, teacher, but in God's eyes, only thing that you're going to uh, inherit and, and be a benefactor of is the kingdom of hell. Chaos, confusion. But here, we were predestined to be benefactors of the kingdom of God. According to his good pleasure and his will. Okay? And then it says in 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us acceptable in the beloved, in Christ. We accepted through and in Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to his riches of his grace. Here it is. Wherein he hath abounded towards us all in all wisdom and prudence. Now, we, we went through the chapter of, of, well, we started the chapter of, of uh, Psalms, you know, talked about this wisdom. You know, God, get, God, that's one of his attributes. But he also portrays upon us wisdom. And he gives us wisdom. He said, if anybody likes it, just ask. It, it's predestined that you and I will be wise in God's eyes. That we not, won't be tricked and, and drawn away by every whim and, and things of this world. You know, and we see a lot of that, unfortunately. Don't be one of them. That be drawn away to the things of this world and be a benefactor of sin when we were predestined to be in Christ. To be holy and acceptable in love. And to be abounded in all wisdom and prudence. And nine, it says, having made known unto us the mystery of his according to his good pleasure which he has purpose in himself so th there is no mystery about what God wants us to do but to understand that you got to have a relationship with him have a relationship with God you know and I'm talking about myself if I'm always trying to ask God what you're doing and all this kind of stuff that means I'm not, I don't have a relationship if he's waking me up every morning and talking to me I should be I should know what he's about not a mystery. He tells me every day what I should be doing. Love, reconciliation, living a life of holiness. Not my holiness. It's going out showing people like a child what God looks like. His love, peace, being a peacemaker. No mystery in the kingdom of God. You know, I still hear Christians, adult, mature Christians still trying to seek God's will. So how can you be in a relationship with God and he don't tell you his will? It's like being in a relationship with, you know, a father not telling the kids what he wants, what he desires of them. Like a husband or wife telling, not telling the spouse, you know, we just living and existing. I don't know what relationship, I don't really care about the relationship or what it looked like. I'm just, but I, I'm in a relationship with you. So it's a mystery what my marriage should look like. It's a mystery what my relationship with my kids should be like. Saints, it's not that hard. So, you know, we don't have to walk around wondering what God wants with us. You know, it's a mystery. I'm still seeking God on what he wants me to do. Get up every day, have a relationship where he will lead and guide you. But you got to turn the stuff off. See, so this world is trying to lead and guide you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Even, especially Christians. You know, it's amazing how now, if you say you're a Christian, or I don't want to use that term evangelical, the world is telling you what you should do. Telling you, I mean, it's amazing how you should vote, what you should do, what you should try to, you know, what your mind should be on. Not, not of Christ. They tell you now what you should be doing as a Christian, the world. So they want you to have a relationship with them, but you're a Christian. When all you got to do is have a relationship with God, he said he won't keep you in the dark. He'll make the mystery of his will, what he wants us to do. And that's based on what God wants us to do. But you can't do that without having a relationship with Christ. And unfortunately, these times, I see people saying they're Christians without having a relationship. They're jumping to the beat of man, but they're not jumping to the beat of Christ. That's not great. That's not great. I think I want to read the rest of this, but... um. I'm not going to read everything, but I want you to go and read the rest of the chapter. It's talking about how we were sealed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of promise. And it talks about the good work that we should be doing and how the wisdom and the re revelation and knowledge of him and, and that our eyes of our understanding be open. 
So read the rest of that if you could. Um, but it talks about our relationship with Christ. He desires us to be great through him. See, God has already predestined us to be in him. Everything that we desire to do, God has already predestined. He's already given us the power and authority and the strength to do that. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And we talked about that. The Holy Spirit is not just to run around, speak in tongues, and show, you know, show everybody how great you are in Christ and in the kingdom. People do that. You know, I, it's, if God called you to do that, wonderful. You know, but sometimes we going up prophesying over people and it ain't time to prophesy. Jesus ain't call you to do that. You're just trying to show off your gifts. That does not make you great. Even in using your gifts, your gift is to be used where God tell you to use them. Come on now. We had Christ here come and he was, he was God. But yet he considered himself a servant and he avowed himself, abased himself to be used by God to the point that he had the gift and all the power and authority in him that created everything, but yet he harnessed that and say, God, your will, not my will be done. So as Christians, we got to be careful. You know, just because Christ give us gifts, it's to be used for his glory, to make he, him look great, not us. Because I'll be honest, he's tired of that. Amen. So we talked about our predestination. While we're in Ephesians, let's go to chapter two really quick. <laughs> chapter two, we're just going to read four through 10. <laughs> I love this. Talk about our predestination. I mean, that encourages me every day because every day that I get up, I don't have to worry about faltering. I don't have, have to worry about missing a mark. All I have to do is follow Christ and walk in that predestination to be great. I don't have to worry about accumulating enough. So you look at me, so look what he got now. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. All I have to do is follow Christ, have a relationship with Christ. He reveals the will of God that God has predestined you and I for every day. Ephesians 2, let's read 4 through 10. And it says here, I'm going to read in the, actually, let's read in the King James. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you were saved. Now, that, come on now. Even when you and I were dead in sin, his desire is for us to have a relationship with his son. Now, I don't know about you, but see, he, 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 he loved me into the kingdom. He sent his Holy Spirit to draw me into the kingdom. Now, yes, somebody was talking about him, but he loved you and I so much that he came down and he drew us because he desired us to be with him. Now, that's love, even though we were against him. And it said, um, again, five, even when we were dead in sins, yet quicken us together with Christ, which means by grace you are saved. Six, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Raise us up together, having the same mind of Christ. He said, greater things should we do in heavenly places. Mind of Christ here, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So just like the rich young ruler, they, you, ain't, you and I didn't do anything to be saved. You know, you can try to keep this and keep that and keep your religious thing going on, but no, nah, that's not great in God's eyes. It's only through faith. Only through faith. It's a gift of God. It's a gift because he, it's a predetermined gift. Not of works. See, how can we become great? Here we go. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I did this. I did that. Look at me. Look what we got. Look at our church. Look at our choir. Look at this. Look at what I did. No, 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 no. That's not greatness. That we will boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus 
unto good works, which God has before ordained or predetermined that we should walk in them. So you and I, we are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship. We are the tools that he used to show his greatness through, such as it said here he did through Christ. So now we are also his workmanship created in him and predestined to do his good works, to show his greatness, that through us, you know, God, his good works can be seen. His greatness can be seen. And that's 10. Now, we probably, I'm not going to take time to go through that, but right now, Philippians, other places that show you in the word, and it's a lot of them. It's, it's, I actually looked at 58 the other day, and I got tired of looking. And I was like, man, this God has really, I, 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 I get this God. I'm predestined, you know, and I said that, and then Nick Parisi reminded me of that the other day when he texted me, we were not created to be without God. We were not created to live without God. We were not created to live without his son. We were not created to live without his spirit because that gives us life. So I thank Brother Parisi for reminding me of that. We were predestined. We were not meant by no way of creation to be without God. We were predestined to be in him. But right now, Philippians 2, 21, Philippians 2, 21, and also 17 and 21, um, when I was reading about that, though, you know, even though we're, be, we're predestined, it talks about, it, it gives us a warning to be heavenly minded and not earthly minded. And that's why I was reminded to turn my plate down this week, because all these things we're predestined in, but see, we got to have the right mindset. And that's why we have this message. So we have a mind and we have a thought of what greatness looks like, even in the kingdom. But is it God's mindset? So it remind us, remind us then to don't mind earthly things. To not put our attention on the things of this earth and the thing that go on in this earth. And I don't want to get into that because y'all see what's going on. And I told somebody this week and I told a bishop this and he got mad. See, I can't serve a one king. I don't have enough strength but to run after one God. So I can't run after God on the earth and run after God in heaven. Now I'm split. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm divided. And I, I can't do that. I don't know how everybody else do that. You might can do that. I can't do that. I, I just can't do that. I, 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 don't, I can't dwell in but one kingdom. And when the kingdom of heaven tells me to sit, I sit. And when it tells me to stand, I stand. Now, you try that. You got two people giving you two different directions, and you just like this. You all over the place. And people call you bipolar. They call you crazy. But you a Christian. Running all over the place, marching, throwing up this, throwing up that. All. I'm getting off a little bit, but it's okay. We got to get back on track. As Christians, we got to get back on track. But he wants us there to be heavenly minded. We can't mind the things of this world and be of God. So I don't know how you do it now. You know, I made a lot of people, I was telling somebody, I made a lot of people mad this week. I had a long week. A long week. It seemed like everybody I want to call and tell me about something in this world. I'm like, what is wrong with you? You know, I dare anybody who does that, turn your plate over. Don't, you ain't got to uh, fast for three days and 19 days like I do. One day, a half a day, fast, pray. But don't just fast and pray. You got to turn off all the noise. And I want you to hear from heaven, and, and I want you to see how clear it is. Heaven is so clear. I love God. He said he's the, not the God of confusion. It's so clear. It's scary. But in, the, in, in this world today, everybody got, I would say, uh, physically, we got tinnitus. Tinnitus is a ringing in your ear. There's so much mess going on. All this stuff. And then you, you're trying to hear God. You can't do it. It's crazy. You know, this world is trying to call you you know, whatever your name is, Ryan, you know, and then you remember the movie. And then somebody, God's trying to tell you, hey, can you just be still? I'm trying to talk to you. I'm trying to give you instructions. You don't have to do all of that. That is not great. I didn't call you to do that. All you have to do is what I tell you to do, say what I tell you to do, and do what I tell you to do. But we got so much noise on. So he reminds us in those scriptures that don't, you can't be concerned about the thing. You can't be earthly minded and kingdom minded at the same time. And people do that. 
It's time for that to stop. Now, also in Romans chapter 8, write that down. Romans chapter 8, Pastor Ed talked about that. He preached on that. He talked about not only were we predestined, but those he predestined, he called. Those who called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified or made great. And then it talks about if God be for us, who can be against us? Nothing, just like they tried to, Satan tried to sift the disciples and Luke, he can't sift you and I. If God be for us, if he had predestined us to be great in his kingdom, there's no forces that can stand against that. Just make sure you're not standing against that. Make sure you're clear what kingdom you're representing. <clears throat> Now, if you go back and look at, we looked at this already, but I just want to clarify this, or amplify this. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 2, 10, Ephesians 1, 13, it talks about, you know, the Holy Spirit, why the Holy Spirit been given us. We've been sealed. It's our seal. And in 2, 10, but we've been sealed with servitude. <coughs> Excuse me. We've been sealed with, the Holy Spirit helps us to serve. My God. And that the Holy Spirit is waiting to be energized. He don't want to be quenched. The Holy Spirit do not want to be quenched by the noise and the things of this world, and especially by us. So the Holy Spirit is given to us so we can be servants. We're sealed with servitude. He's given us the power to serve. Or you can be like the Pharisees and Sadducees. They, the power that God gave you is the flock. You can be like the rich young ruler and think, you know, the power and just go God giving you the ability to get wealth. You got to get all the wealth you can and you forget about relationship. See, God don't care about your wealth and accumulation. I only care about relationship. OK. <clears throat> and Jesus give us many examples wrapping up. Give, Jesus give us many examples during this walk, during his walk of how to be a servant. I mean, come on. And John. 13, 1 through 7, when you look at that, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He gives them by example. John 13, 1 through 7. And then one disciple's about, you know, you can't wash. Jesus said, you know, if I can't wash your feet, you can't be in their mind because I'm showing you what you got to do. So you won't go out and do what you want to do and think that it's a man, think you've been a servant. Because sometimes we get confused. We want to go out and do what we think is serving God based on our abilities and our finesse and, you know, the things that we accumulate, you know, uh, on our own power and what we think. But here Jesus said, no, I'm going to show you what it means and what it looks like to be a servant. So when I leave, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want, how I want you to base yourself, abase yourself and bring yourself low to love and to minister to people. So the people can see the greatness of God. In John 21, 1 through 14, he prepares a meal for his disciples. Again, servitude. And I said again in another uh, um, uh, uh, preaching I did, I didn't know, you know, Jesus was a chef. I didn't know he could cook. You know, remind me of Catherine, some of those other ones in, 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 in the ministry, they, they, they cook. So whatever your gift is, Jesus is telling you, you use it. So here Jesus, he prepares a meal for disciples. Again, servitude. The great I am, he's showing servitude. So there's no mystery of what we can do to be great. He shows us and tells us. Come on, this they're telling. He's just saying the words, I want you to go out and do this. No, all we have to do is look at the life of Christ and his service to God, and we see what greatness looks like. We don't have to come up with something new. It's no mystery. We don't have to have a 24-hour prayer to figure out what to do. And I'm nothing wrong with a 24-hour prayer. But we, we don't have to, to have a 24-hour prayer to, to, to ask God what to do. All we got to do is look at what Jesus did and repeat it. You know, I'm talking to some, it's nothing wrong. I pray sometime long. I do that, but depending on what day it is. I, some days, most days I pray for about five, 10 minutes, and I get up and live for him the rest of the day. If I prayed all day, I ain't got no chance to go out and be a servant. So there's nothing wrong with praying, but then you're praying, go out and do something. You know, you're not impressing God by, oh, I pray every day for about four or five hours. No, go to your job and be a servant. Show them what Christ looks like. 
Oh, I don't know where that came from, but I'm gonna blame that on the Holy Spirit. You know, some people get at, get in trouble at work, at work trying to let me leave that alone. Y'all, y'all seen them with the Bibles and everything. And I'm like, put your Bible up and check my people in so I can see them. No, don't nobody do that on my job. They do that on your job, on my job, because I fire you. And then you accept the devil that no, okay, I'm done. I'm done. So moving on. So he washes the feet, he prepares the meal. And now in so many scriptures, here we go, this last point. He says, now, let this mind be in you and I. Now, no mystery, y'all. No mystery of how to be great. All the things around us that we see is so-called great, and we keep seeing people fall because they, they don't have character to back up their greatness. Mm, they're benefactors of the world. Now, the world lets you benefit, by the way. But you remember where that leads. That leads to hell, sin, hypocrisy. It, it don't lead to life. But being benefactors of the kingdom, he said, let this mind be in you. Be a servant as Christ did. Let this mind be in you. Write this down. Matthew eleven twenty two. 22. You, you'll find this all over in the New Testament. Uh, 20, <clears throat> Matthew 20, 26 through 28. And we're taping this too, so you can go back and look at it. Luke 22, 27. And the last scripture we're about to read, and when we're done, is Philippians. So Philippians, go to Philippians real quick, chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. Christ's example of humility here. Mm. Y'all ready? Amen. Philippians 2, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to probably go down to verse 13. A lot of nuggets here. We just get one point and move on. <clears throat> and now he says here, this is talking about Christ's example of humility. Let this same mind be in you that was in Christ. So now you and I could appear great like Christ did, but Christ didn't even determine his greatness. He based it on what God told him to do. Now, that blows me away. And I know people think that hypocrisy, but Christ didn't just go around doing what he wanted to do and to telling you, oh, I'm the great I am. I'm the son of God. No, he said, I'm great because I do what my father in heaven tells me to do. And now he says, let the same I be in you. <clears throat> Verse one. If therefore be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels of mercy, now, that means if you think you any kind of way of a Christian, here's what he's telling you to do. Fulfill ye my joy and be ye like-minded, having the same love, being in one accord on one mind. Now, you look at today now, Christians running all around, all over the place. This is right. That is right. This, what in God's name? That ain't us. That, that, that's not that's not that's not the kingdom. There's no confusion in the kingdom. And then we got to fuss and argue about what we think is what going on this earth is right or wrong. It, this is not our kingdom. We're supposed to be on one accord, one mind. They ain't three gods. They, they ain't three Holy Spirits telling you something and somebody else something. And, so, and now I ask people, so why did you do that? Well, I, well, at least they told the truth. They said I thought the Holy Spirit, and I said he, the, the, the the Spirit did, but it won't holy. Some spirit told you that, but it won't the Holy Spirit. It was a spirit. Back to the word. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness, lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. No, no bickering, no fighting. I'm supposed to esteem you more than myself. There, there's no division. But that's supposed to be in the church body. Not just at KCM, that's supposed to be at every church. Anybody who called themselves a Christian that's in the body of Christ, this is the church. Four, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, we're Christian. Greatness don't look like selfishness. Greatness is you go out and you put your mind on the things of, you know, help other people solve their problems. You know, not, not yours, worrying about what you got. Understanding the gift that God given us is to share. 
And then here it says in five, here we go. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The things that we just read, that's what Jesus did. And if you want to quarrel or argue about that, go read the life of Christ. That's what he did. He looked upon others more than he did himself. He did the things of God. He looked at the disciples and everyone who came, but he actually stopped whatever he was doing to minister to them. He wasn't, he was never too busy and too into himself that he didn't have time to minister to people and make himself a servant unto them. Who being in the form of God, Jesus was, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. We talked about that, but made himself of no reputation, no reputation, no reputation, no. You know we love our reputation. Y'all know we love our rep. Girl, that girl can sing. That man can preach. Did you see how that deacon take up? Oh, he can take up three offerings. Boy, he can rake that money in. You let him take up that offering. We love our reputation. I've been in, I've been in churches where, you know, you, you know, you got that go-to guy for everything, that go-to girl for everything. We love our reputation. Don't say you don't. We do. But it got to be crushed to be a servant of God. Let his mind that is in Christ also be in you and I. Seven, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. We are to put, take upon ourselves the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became, oh my God, dirty word, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Oh, God tell us to do little small stuff. It's too hard. I don't have time. I don't have the resources. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Now, because he abased himself and became a servant, now, therefore, God also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Now, we just read that because he did that in Christ. Now, God is trying to show himself strong in us. So the same way he highly exalted Christ, he wanted to highly exalt you and I before men to show his love to men. Not that you and I will be seen great to men, but be great to God. He wanted to show his love, his greatness through us. Now, that, 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 that same that he did through Christ, he telling us, let that mind be in you so God can do this to us. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. So think about this. He didn't, he didn't set Christ high above in heaven because he was Jesus or of his power and his authority. He set him high because of his humility, his servitude. Now, I know that that, that rocks me. He didn't put Jesus uh, high and exalted uh, above the earth because of his skill set, because of his finesse and the way he talked, the way he drawed people. The way, you know, he really know how to draw that crowd in before he speak. He didn't do any of that. The way, the way he, he know, hey, boy, he know how to have a meeting. Every time you turn around, he got people coming to that mountain, he's speaking. Nope. He exalted Christ high in the heavens and set him above everything and everything will be under his feet. Everything is subjected unto him because he was a servant. He humbled himself and everything under the earth and let every tongue and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. And it says here, I just want to go down to 13 again. Therefore, my beloved, as ye has have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But all we got to do is do those things that Christ did. Here it is. For it is God which worketh in you and me, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Only God is great. And all we have to do is I base ourselves that you want to be great is abase ourselves and be obedient and be a servant. God has empowered you and I to be great. He's given us his greatness by his Holy Spirit to be servants. That we can submit ourselves as Christ did to his will. So I like to say it this way. You are destined for greatness 
because the seed of greatness is inside of you. Let me say it again in closing. You are destined for greatness only because the seed of greatness, Christ, God himself, is inside of you. And that great I am inside of you would cause you and I to be great in God's eyes. Now, you may not be great in man's eyes, but it's okay because you don't want to be the benefactor of what man got to give you. But you want to be great in God's eyes. So saints, how do you see yourself? <laughs> how do you see yourselves in God's eyes being great? It's not a mystery here that we see. God wants us to be great. He predestined us to be great, to do his good and great works. Through Jesus Christ, he's made that avenue. And then he's empowered us by the Holy Spirit. So if any confusion of what greatness is, I conclude with this. Turn the TV down and turn your plates down. Seek a relationship with God. Now I'm talking about a true relationship. That's trusting and abiding in him. Trusting and abiding in him is means that you trust God even for your very life. And you do as Christ did unto God, that you say and do only what he say and tells you to do and say. Because you do that, see, you can only, you will walk in great because Christ and God himself will live a life through you and I. And that's what we're here for. We were predestined for that. We weren't predestined for anything else. So don't be drawn away by anything else on this earth. Don't be earthly minded. Be heavenly minded so that you and I can demonstrate the greatness of God through Jesus Christ and by his Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this time spent with you, Father, and one another. We thank you, Father God, for you have predestined us to be in you, Father God. You predestined us to, to be in love and, 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 and be perfect in you, Father God, and to demonstrate uh, your, your greatness through us, Father God. You predestined us from before the foundation of the world as you did Christ, Father God, to be with you. And Father God, we pray, Father God, if anyone that's listened to this, this, this broadcast, Father God, that does not have a relationship with you, Father God, may be confused about the things that are going on in this, in this world, that they would, Father God, first just repent, Father God, which means to turn from their ways and, Father God, to accept you as a Lord and Savior right where they are. They just ask you, Father God, to, to be their voice, to be the ear, be, 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 be the eyes of them, Father God. You will come into our hearts and live through us and in us, direct us, Father God, in everything that we do. Father God, just trading off the benefits and being benefactors of this world to being benefactors of the kingdom. We put off death and we take on life. So Father God, we receive life today by just saying, Father God, we invite you into our hearts, into our spirits, and into our lives. And we seek to follow you. We seek to have a relationship with you that such as Christ walked with you and demonstrated your love and was a servant to all men, Father God, that we seek to do the same. And Father God, we just thank you today, Father God, that when we walk upon this earth, Father God, that we will be seen as great by you and the greatness, Father God, that in, in Christ himself and, in, and God himself will be seen through us, Father God, and we will put away all other things, Father God. Thank you for allowing us, Father God, to only hear your voice during this time, and thank you for keeping us. And your word says that you actually keep us in perfect peace, whose mind is dead on you. We believe in this, we trust in it, we have faith in it, Father God. Until we meet again, Father God, continue to bless us and keep us. In your precious holy name, amen. Thanks, you guys. You have a good, blessed week. Love you all. Be blessed. Bring your bar. Okay, let me see. Go ahead, Ian. Thank you for all.